What is up, theology nerds? This is Trip, and today you get a very special episode of the podcast. It is a live podcast recording with not one, but two guests. Mm-hmm. We are joined by Stan Mitchell and Dr. Robin Henderson Espinoza. This conversation was fun. It was in a, in a lively crowd in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, hosted um, by my good friend, Andy Peterson. So, yeah, yeah, that's going to be a fun fun conversation. We're going to talk about all sorts of different things, like uh, the transition that a lot of evangelicals have been going through around issues around sexuality, um, how uh, American Christianity's connection to slaveholding Christianity. We're going to talk about the power of front porch and cheese fries. Uh, and at the very end, um, I end up uh, um, sounding like a preacher. But... Before we jump in, I want to tell everyone a few things. One, one thing, one thing is the good Dr. Robin Henderson Espinoza has a book about to come out this October. That's right. This October, Dr. Robin has a book coming out called Activist Theology. And as part of all the excitement and the promotion of Activist Theology, Homebrewed Christianity is trying to help lure you into buying their book to pre-ordering their book to be specific. That's right. Dr. Robin's book um, on, on activist theology. I've read it. It's amazing. It's exciting. We talk about it in this episode. But you may be saying to yourself, then then I, I think I, 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 might, I might get it. But might. Might. Why might? Do it. And here's the thing. If you pre-order the book on whatever way you pre-order books on the internet, um, you know, then you forward your receipt to goactivisttheology at gmail.com with one T. Like the end of activist and the beginning of theology, only one T there. It's a it's a connector T. Go activist theology at gmail dot com, and you will get Doctor Robin's lecture from Theology Beer Camp, which was fire. Um, you'll get this amazing panel conversation they facilitated with uh, Nathan Gilmore from the Christian Humanist, Anna Galladay. It was a ton of fun, uh, and you're going to get um, Robin and I's class on theologies of resistance right there. All just for pre-ordering a book, which you're, it would just be good to do anyway. So forward your receipt to goactivisttheology at gmail.com with one T, not two T's. Activists in theology are sharing a T. Uh, you can also go to my website, uh, Homebrewed Christianity. Look for the post of this page, and you'll find out more. Um, a couple other exciting little details is it September 27th and 28th. September 27th and 28th. There will be um, an event called called to be prophets in Cary, North Carolina, which is Raleigh, Durham. Um, it is going to be, uh, you know, a, 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 an exciting time because not only is Robin Henderson Espinosa going to be there, but Brian McLaren is going to be there. You know, Brian, writer, speaker, activist, theologian and regular friend of the podcast. He's going to be talking about some eco theology. Um, and uh, Steve Davidson, who is the Hebrew Bible scholar and dean at McCormick Seminary in Chicago. He is a, a, a master of the prophetic literature, post-colonial studies, black theology, and he'll be bringing uh, a good word, a challenging word, a prophetic word for everyone there. Um, I'll be there doing some stuff, podcasting, interviewing, facilitating, emceeing, and I have a really sweet talk I'm going to do. So here's the thing. Um, September 27th and 28th, you should come. It'll be exciting, and there's a good reason to come, too. Why is that, you may say? Well, um, right after it, I moved to, to Scotland, to Edinburgh. So it would be my last event, homebrewed event, here in the States for a while. So if you've been thinking about coming, you should come. October, I'm going to be in the U.K., so September 27th, 28th, call to be prophets. You can get details on the website. If you use the code TRIP, then you get a discount. Yeah, put my name on there. There is a version of the event that's like all two days that um, is geared towards more ministers. And then there's a version of the event that's like Friday night and all day Saturday. Um, so, yeah, check them out. Holler at me if you're coming. it will be a blast. All right. Last but not least, before we jump in. Um, I hope everyone checked out the previous episode, my special announcement about moving to Scotland. But if you haven't, go check it out and um, 
and then and then think about supporting it because basically, and this is the brief version, I got offered a position um, at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, it doesn't include transition costs, like moving all the way across uh, the Atlantic, which in when it, when you have a family of five, is on the uh, super expensive side. But as many of you know, I've been doing this podcast eleven years now. I've been invested in theological education the whole time, and finally have a chance. Right? I finally have a chance at a, 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 an entry. A job, a full time position in the uh, um, theological academy, which um, uh, my family's going to jump at. So, if you'd like to help support us getting over there, you can check out uh, the GoFundMe or just become a homebrewed member. A homebrewed member. If you jo- go to homebrewedcommunity.com, you can uh, donate every month and then you'll get access to all sorts of stuff like our intro to theology course that's going to be running all year. The Intro to Theology course is for all the homebrewed elders and bishops, and this class is basically going to try to be giving you all the background information that a lot of the guests assume, right? Like they teach theology, philosophy classes, and the the like. They assume stuff when we're interviewing about a book, um, and and this class is geared to give you give you the basics of framework, introduce you to thinkers and concepts and schools of thought, and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, and not only that, but there's been a number of people that have uh, joined recently, mm-hmm. like uh, three Stevens, no joke, three different people named Steven joined recently. So I, I'm my brother's a Steven. Maybe Stevens and I just get along real well. John joined Brandon, David, Hannah, Sean, Isaiah, Brendan, Carly, Raphael, Travis, Sarah, and Nicole. All brand new members of the Homebrewed community. And now you can too. Just go to homebrewedcommunity.com. All right? Now, to set the stage, this is a live podcast in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, it was a rainy night. And yet, the warmth of the community was rich. And we have a whole lot of fun. I uh, hope you enjoy it. Go to the website. Check out all the details. Uh, and uh, again, remember, Robin has a new book coming out. You can pre-order it. Send that receipt to GoActivistTheology at Gmail with one T. And boom, you're going to get free goods. And you'll probably sleep better at night. All right? Smoochie boochies. Hello, Homebrew Christianity listeners. This is Trip. I'm hanging out in Nashville with two of my favorite people, Stan Mitchell and the doctor, Robin Henderson Espinoza. And we're in Nashville in the middle of NFL playoffs and rain. And yet, these beautiful people are here. So y'all should clap and say something so people know you exist. And... Um, so, uh, I get five questions with each of you. Stan is up first, but the first question is the easiest question. When you are going to be honest and someone asks you what it is you do, like you're okay if you let the God out of the bag. You mean not trying to hedge and yeah, yeah. I'm embarrassed? Like when we were, you know, when we got the rental cars. What did I say? You're like, we write and speak and, hey, he's a professor. You know, it's like, ask him what he... Yeah, that yeah, I mean, preacher, if, preachers, if, pastors have fallen. I, um, I, I will say I'm a, a a pastor at times. Well, what's tell tell you? This is one of my five questions. So you have to you have to give me a little more than that. So when I ask you who is Stan and what does he do, how do you how do you describe it? Uh, I do about five. I mean, I've been a pastor since I was a kid. So uh, that will always be. I, I don't think it's just something I do. I think it's a part of who I am. So I am a pastor. I'm also. Writing a book, uh, I, 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 I'm an advocate for the LGBTQ community. I've kind of turned into a pastor at large for that community uh, through Facebook, something I didn't suspect would happen. I found out that in advocating and reaching out, you, you get lots of responses. And there are tons of people, LGBTQ Christians, who are 300 miles from an inclusive church. Mm-hmm. And their kids are suicidal, and they're wrestling with all the stuff. And so I've ended up pastoring them. That's a big piece. Yeah. All right. So you um, church planted. I, I'm a church planter's kid. Um, it's fun, uh, exciting, slash terrifying, and heart-wrenching experience. Um, but you've been at the church for how long now? So we started Grace Point 2003. What's that? 15 and a half years. So when was the point in it that... You had to say yes again. When I talk with church planters, those that, you know, persevere, push through and really fall in love with the church all over again, there's some point where you go, ah, do I need to be here or not? And anyone that's been there that long has had that, uh, that first naivete of church love 
uh, disappear. So what was that moment where you had to choose to be pastor again? Uh, I think 2003 to 2015 were the halcyon days. We had a 12-year run with little uh, difficulty. 2015, we did LGBTQ uh, inclusion, and that was a tough gig. And it's been tough since then. It's it's getting good now. Um, I don't know that I had to say yes again. I don't know that I ever said yes again. I, I think probably me saying no again has been the best thing that could possibly happen for the church because mm-hmm. the church now is looking for a new lead pastor to replace me. Mm-hmm. So I, I think I took the church where I was supposed to take it. Now I'm my no is probably the best yes. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. So. When you think of, uh, I mean, I want you to get a little more out on that. Uh, so a lot of people that listen to the podcast that reach out to me are leaders in churches and they are ahead of what they think their congregation believes on issues like LGBTQ inclusion or, um, uh, a, a robust affirmation of religious pluralism or a kind of moving beyond kind of penal substitutionary atonement and things like that. And for those that grow up in an evangelical context, uh, changing your mind on certain issues is scary, costly, and fearful. Um, so for how do you talk to those in leadership that know where God is and where God's going and have that hesitation like, well, I have health insurance. I also said I was going to serve these people and I believe these, but I've changed my mind and blah, blah, blah. Like, how do you, how do you kind of affirm, shake and challenge people in that context? Yeah. I, I mean, honestly, it took me, it took me a while to get courage. And I think I, I built it a little bit along the way. I, one thing that I, I can't do is get all self-righteous and holier than thou. Once I made the decision and became cannon fodder. Now I'm going to impose that on everybody else. My mm-hmm. process was a long process. I, I would say this, and I, and I say this quite frequently to my friends who are in that place and are scared to death. You know, I, I don't know how many opportunities Western people have to actually do anything that even approximates picking up a cross, but this may be one of them. And for people who take seriously the cross um, and the idea of following, you know, a, a crucified Lord, Man, for all of us worried about our pensions and our incomes, this this is probably the closest we're going to get to the Fox's Book of Martyrs, and it's still a long way away. So come on, get some balls, and take up your cross and do what you're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. When um, what was the what was the point in your theological exodus that you knew you couldn't go back to Egypt anymore? Geez, I, I I don't think I can hone that down. I, I started in such an uber fundamentalist world, and you and I've talked about this. I, I literally started in such a caricatured form of fundamentalism that it was kind of fortuitous for me because it was so ridiculously fundamentalist. I had to react to it. Well, and, and, and kind of describe that because one of the things uh, people listen to the podcast, a lot of them ha- are either never religious or grew up mainline or more progressive, and giving. Character to it, I think it's helpful, especially in the only version of it you really experienced is the the TV version. Hey, yeah, the I mean, if you looked at like religion from a Christianity, my Christianity in taxonomy, it's like Christian, Protestant, Wesleyan, Nazarene, Pentecostal, and then Apostolic Pentecostal. So I grew up in a subculture of a subculture of very exclusivistic Christians. I mean, we. I'm not joking when I say we thought Billy Graham was lost. And when we did comparative world religion studies, it was Nazarenes and Baptists and Methodists that we were looking at in those studies. So You thought I, Billy Graham was lost? We did. I yeah. mean, I think his son might be, but uh, that's for yeah. completely that, different reasons. That's such an underhanded pitch. Uh, yes. Just let one go by. Just You don't have to swing at everyone. Well, <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway... That's where I grew Praise up. Praise God for shoeboxes. You got to repurpose the shoebox. I don't. I don't know that I ever had. I. I. I don't have any stark epiphanies. It's just been a slow, grinding, gradual process of seeing things. I think better. What What was? Uh, the, how would you describe that movement? I know you and I've had a conversations uh, yesterday and today about kind of how your own experience or articulation of kind of records movement in and out of naivete. Can you, can you describe 
kind of what that's been for you, not just as an individual, but as someone who's been leading a faith community as you've gone through a process, that whole movement out and return? <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I I remember the first my my first pinhole of light was when my Methodist neighbor lady gave me a Max Licato book. I was 19 years old, and in our denomination, we were not supposed to read what was called external literature. Max Licato was edgy. Yeah, Max Licato was <laughs> external literature. And I'm not kidding you when I tell you I put so ex- just to clarify. <laughs> I just thought of, external literature means not the Bible. It means not written. And published through our publishing house okay. and our our people who have the truth. Right? Yeah, I, I would yeah. just imagine like that there was a version of the Bible. It's like we allow the co- chapters and numbers because they help you move around, but no extra commentary. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I had a Max. Best way I can describe it is I, I put that Max Licato book under my bed for a year, and I finally pulled it out one day. I was kind of running dry on sermons, and I thought nobody in the little Pentecostal churches I would preach, would have any recognition of his material. So I was reading it, and I was scandalized that somebody that didn't know the truth could speak so movingly about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I figured something out about religious writers, especially evangelical writers. If you really want to know what an evangelical writer thinks, don't read what they write. Read who they read. Yeah. Because they all read people further out than what their milieu can sustain. But so I, I I don't know where I figured it out, but pretty early I figured out if you go to the bibliography of somebody who moves you, you're going to find who moved them. And, you know, Lakato led to Swindoll and Stanley and those guys. Those guys pretty quickly led to Yancey and Campolo. Once you hit Yancey, then it's not far, but, you know, until you hit now and Lingle and Beekner. And when you hit Beekner, you hit Union. And then all of a sudden you get Niebuhr and Tillich. And I literally, I don't know how else to say it, except I slowly, grindingly bibliographied my way upstream to a, a broader faith world. So, uh, I mean, I do think that's important. It's actually a really smart move to check people's bibliography. Um, so much, I've inserted things into my book just so, <laughs> so if someone looked, it would be there. An impressive bibliography. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Has nothing to do with your book except padding yeah. the bibliography. Yeah, you're like, <laughs> I, really, I really feel like this bibliography needs more Cobb and Keller. So I'm just going to go through. <laughs> but uh, so my, I mean, my family were Baptist church planners, but uh, not, I guess they were really bad Southern Baptists because. In middle school, when I asked questions, my parents would give me a book. They wouldn't answer it. I'm like, well, after you read this, we'll talk about it because we're Baptists, so like you have soul freedom. Like we don't want to think for you; we want to think with you. And um, middle school is the first time I got a Paul Tillich book. It was Paul Tillich sermons, and um, uh, which I just realized, like, why you said that, thinking like. My son will be 13 in a few years, and that's when I read my first Paul Tillich. The idea of handing that to him seems really odd. But uh, so I don't. This isn't a suggestion that this is good parenting, but um, for someone who <laughs> whose kid is like me, yes, it is. And uh, one of the sermons in it was uh, his refrain in it is, "Accept the fact you were accepted." Last night, you and I were talking, and you said one of the challenges it for you, you see in Christianity and the kind of uh, emergence of a new form of Christianity is leaving behind a Christianity that centers on that's primarily about Christology and a particular atonement theory. And when you dropped me off, I started thinking about that refrain being very early in my life that one of the deepest challenges as a Christian is accepting the fact you're accepted. Believing what God has already said about you in Christ is the most true thing, as opposed to the things we internalize and say to ourselves. Um, can you can you share about the what was going on in you as you mo- as you start to see an idea you were handed as final, as really an idea you engaged when you first encountered the living God, but that idea wasn't uh, around like atonement and Christology and stuff weren't necessary for that relationship but a means to engaging it yeah when people ask me if i believe in you know if i theoretically believe in penal substitutionary atonement i say absolutely it was a beautiful part of our history um Mm -hmm. i you know i the the night before the crucifixion john has jesus saying i have a lot that i want to tell you but you can't bear it now 
But when the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit will lead and guide you into all truth. There's no asterisk or disclaimer there, you know, no ibid at the bottom that says, and that will be finished by the end of the first century or with, you know, the finished work of the text or the fifth through seventh century creeds. You know, the inferences, and if church history tells us anything, is that the Holy Spirit is continuing to unfold truth like a time-release medicine as human consciousness has the capacity to hear it. And I don't know how we can look at church history. I I personally uh, feel like I'm a traditionalist, and that's not – I'm not trying to get, you know, cheeky or cute with words. I think the tradition of Christianity is progressive in nature, and I think it's unfolding. And if church history tells us anything, the church is ever – about the business of that Sermon on the Mount rubric of you heard it said, but I say unto you. That's not a desecration of Moses. He said, I, I'm trying to give Moses his fullest meaning. And I, I don't think God's playing cat and mouse with us. I don't even like when progressives become the new fundamentalist and look back condescendingly and self-righteously and dismiss everything. That's, mm-hmm. that's the beauty of the spiral dynamics thing that everybody's talking about. You know, transcend and include. We're just... We're dealing with the text today as faithfully as we know how. And I don't know that there's ever been a time in church history where people were waking up trying to be wrong or stupid or mean. Uh, I I think most are doing the best we can do with the knowledge we have. I don't look back at my evangelical fundamentalist upbringing. I don't enjoy sitting around with people who want to lick their wounds and talk about all the, you know, the damage that was done. I'm sure that that did happen. Uh, And I, I know there were a lot of contaminants and toxins in the water, but it was water. And, you know, like uh, the child in Haiti that I saw drinking sewage water, she knew two things. It was going to hydrate her and save her life, and it was going to make her sick. But the noun was water, and the toxins, I don't remember anybody who were hypocrites trying to teach me something wrong about God. They were teaching me what they knew at that moment, and it hydrated me. And I've detoxed since then, but I don't have any reason to cast aspersions on that because we're accumulating wisdom, mm-hmm. and as human consciousness grows, and I think incarnational experiences, life together, wallows out a capacity in us to hear things that we couldn't have heard before. And if the Lord tarries his coming, as we say, <laughs> for all those years, um, I, I, I suppose 300 years from now, people will look back aghast at the things that we're missing. But I know today I woke up with my heart open and so that's the way I view progressive Christianity, not as an affront to the past, um, but as including the past and, and just doing our best, just like they were doing their best. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, I got two more. Do you believe in Santa Claus? Yes, I do believe in Santa Claus. So you have to tell the story. Like I, oh, You told it to me yesterday. That was such a poor setup. I, no, I said I'm going to ask you a question so you can tell the story I know, about that, Santa Claus. Then... Uh, now, now everyone okay. knows. I heard it, thought it was good, and was just trying to give a preacher an opportunity to use a high quality I story. I knew that's what you were doing. It was such a stilted effort. I thought I'd just be a smart ass. <laughs> well, but for being a smart ass, I appreciate your. Okay. In, I you know, your yeah. daughter's right there. She's going to assess whether. It's so true or not. so, don't say anything, sis. Um, Paul Ricoeur, the phenomenologist. I guess he just passed away back in 2012. Lived into his 90s. Ricoeur. You know, he, he's a, a Gautamer guy, uh, Derrida. He's a brilliant guy. But one of the things that I think was most beautiful about Ricor in terms of how we bring our horizon, as Gautamer would say, to the horizon of an ancient text or sacred re- religion, um, Ricor said in, in the merging of those horizons, generally people of faith, as they deal with their religious mythology, their religious mythos, um, their sacred text, they're going to go through three phases. This is what you're talking about. They're going to go through what Ricoeur called first naivete, and I love this, sophistication, and I think there's a bit of tongue-in-cheek there, first naivete, sophistication, and second naivete. He also called that pre-critical thought, critical thought, and post-critical thought. Well, we all know what first naivete is. It's a literal, it's an over-historicized, scientific, literalized version, you know, of a relationship with a sacred text. Mm-hmm. And when people leave fundamentalism the way I left fundamentalism, generally there's an overreaction to that first naivete hold on religion, and that is a very dry, um, self-righteous, condescending uh, sophistication. 
we we get enamored with you know deconstructing and we get smart. But Ricoeur said whenever people move out of first naivete religiously into sophistication, generally that move is uh, is accompanied. It, it's a grief process, and there are several dispositions that he pointed out. He said the first move away from first naivete and fundamentalist hold on religion. Uh, generally, the person who moves away, at first, they are shocked. They're shocked that maybe it's not inerrant, that mm-hmm. that maybe there are legendary accretions, you know, on our text. And they're shocked by the fact that Paul may not have written <laughs> First and Second Timothy. I found that really positive, considering... Uh some of the things that were said in first and second. Yeah, time. yeah. Well, you you had a little bit of an American Baptist uh, softening. So, the us down here, we didn't get that softening. So, we went from shock to lit. Record said generally shock is then followed by sadness. Yeah, sadness is generally followed by a bit of anger, looking around at everybody and thinking you duped us, and anger is often followed by embarrassment. Um, I, I can't believe that this has happened. And so the way we offset the embarrassment is to get quite self-righteous and condescending and eye-rolling toward anybody who's where we were. Because the more we can judge them, the more we kind of psychologically scapegoat them and distance ourselves. And so, you know, my daughter who's here tonight went through the process, um, like all kids do, of letting go of a literal Santa Claus. And I remember. And, and the people that I was talking about, um, they're here tonight too. I remember when my daughter came home one day and looked at us and said, there's no Santa Claus. Uh, She, within hours, was expressing not just the shock, the dismay, the sadness, but she was pretty, she was pretty aggravated that there had been this complex matrix set up where even some of her classmates knew a couple of years before she did. So we walked through all of that, and I remember we went over to the fellow that's sitting beside her, their house, and their kids are younger than Nina, and I remember when Nina began to watch them still engaging the myth of Santa Claus, there was a lot of eye rolling, and and she really couldn't enjoy their hold on that because, of course, that's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And it was shortly after that that I looked at her one day, and that's when I said, hey, sis, I need to tell you something. I still believe in Santa Claus. And she said, no, you don't. And I did my best to explain That second naivete doesn't believe that Santa Claus is less than first naivete. It actually believes it's more. And I think one of the, one of the deficits that any reform movement makes is the freshman mistake is often replaced with an almost equally and bad reactionary sophomoric mistake of becoming just as self-righteous as we were before and distancing ourselves. Joni Mitchell wrote the song Both Sides Now. And in there, she talks about first naivete, sophistication, and then second naivete. She speaks of clouds, and she says, rows and flows of angels' hair, and ice cream castles in the air, feather canyons everywhere. I looked at clouds that way, first naivete. But now they only block the sun. They rain and they snow on everyone. So many things I would have done, but clouds got in my way. Sophistication. Cynicism, bereft of any joy, curiosity, wonder. Second naivete, I've looked at clouds from both sides now, from up and down and still somehow. It's clouds illusions, I recall. I really don't know clouds at all. That's why Roar's always telling us the young person who doesn't weep is a barbarian. The old person who doesn't laugh is a fool. Um, Ron Rollheiser you know, Brueggemann says it's orientation, disorientation, reorientation. Uh, you know, it's pre-critical, critical, post-critical. I love Ron Rollheiser, the Catholic priest, said it's happy, unhappy, happy. <laughs> it's beautiful. So for me, I remember when Yancey and Licato helped Jesus save God for me. But then the red letters kind of began to wear thin for me through the years, and, and Jesus' seminars wore me out. Um, but eventually to come back to Santa Claus, to come back and realize that there is a kernel of St. Nicholas, and the accretions maybe aren't lies. Maybe the accretions that we add on legendarily are just projections of our own divinity that we could not sustain ourselves. So we projected it onto the hero until we finally realize 
that that Campbell was right. The hero wears a thousand faces. And so, yeah, I think, I think Christianity still has a lot of meat on the bone. And I don't want to see it lost in this place that is bereft of meaning. And we can't, you know, just because I don't believe in substitutionary penal atonement, um, I think Paul was brilliant to appropriate the death of Jesus in a first century setting in that way. I think it was brilliant. And I think we have to follow that same slope and extrapolate that principle, that slope, that trajectory out. But man, I still feel like that, you know, on behalf of the LGBTQ community, there are some preachers that need to pick up a cross. There's still meaning in all of this. So that's the Santa Claus. And and when people say, are you comparing Jesus to Santa Claus? Well, in a way, yes, but I love Santa Claus dearly. And I don't believe Jesus is a non-legendary figure. I do understand. I, I, I can read Mark and Matthew and Luke and then compare them to the Johannine text. Uh, Jesus didn't say that facts will set you free. He said the truth will. And so I'm trying to push that we don't get stuck in sophistication mm-hmm. and dry, nihilistic, you know, nothingness. There is beauty in this thing called Christianity still. That's my take mm-hmm. anyway. Oh, I, I, I appreciate it. Santa Claus. I know. Um, I'm, my beer's empty. I know. I oh, thank you. Sharing is caring. Um, the, so my last question is: You're transitioning to an apostolic style ministry, which it's very rare anything near progressive would use the word apostle towards anything they're doing. So um, I was like, eh, that's kind of that's kind of badass that you're like, I'm going to reclaim apostolic. It just sounds cool, but. Um, when you when you're thinking of that transition, like who are the people that could be listening in a vocational situation or considering it that you're wanting to connect with, call together, energize, say they're not alone, and that kind of thing? Give, yeah. Give, give the give the holler. Well, you and I both know, and I feel I feel anywhere from two to, gosh, conservatively two to five calls a day from pastors around the country. I don't want to be cliche, but it really is a Nicodemus project. There are so, there are so many evangelical pastors who, um, right now are towing the precipice of this, you know, this sophistication and it's wearing them out and they're thinking better thoughts about God. Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. said the mind once exposed to a better idea can never shrink to its original size, which is a fancy way of saying when, when, Truth appears, you know, you're screwed. You can't go back in good conscience. Mm. And these guys and gals are in our pulpits all over the country, and they're trying to find courage to at least lead a a church into these conversations, these kind of post-evangelical progressive Christian conversations. Liberal theology is not new. The Reformation that's happening right now is a post-evangelical iteration and appropriation of good You know, Schleiermacher was talking about this 180 years ago. But these things are just now hitting a lot of evangelical people, and I think they're thinking good thoughts, but they're scared to death because most of these people, you know, in the evangelical world, I was 16 when I was enlisted into ministry. And, you know, it's you're almost in that world. You you get your call in your 20s. You do college. You do seminary. You put all of your eggs into a, you know, a, a degree that's really not transferable to anything. And you're doing all of that work. I mean, even, I mean, have a high Christology. When God lived a human life, he didn't start talking and acting like a sage till he was 30. We ought to add 10 years onto that. All of us who were preaching and being gurus at 24 and 27 and setting our career for the rest of our life, we hadn't even done our own work. We ought to, I mean, we ought to all be on a E! Entertainment special with Danny Bonaducci and Gary Coleman. Like, we're religious child stars. It's just, it's pathological. So the problem is that these guys and gals put all their eggs in that basket. They get their degree, they get into a career, and then they wake up somewhere between 35 and 42, and they're like, oh, my God, I don't know that I believe this. But they've got college funds, and they've got, you know, they've, they've, they're really stuck. And those are the people that are reaching out to me every day that I'm spending lots of time with. They are the Nicodemus who come to Jesus under the cover of night. Rabbi, we know. And Jesus hits him right in the mouth, and he falls back like a drunk man on the ropes, and he covers up. How can a man be born? Nicodemus, you know. And three times after that, he's a disciple of the night. But eventually, he's so deeply moved by Jesus that 
he's one of the ones with Joseph that threw the towel in on his life and begged the body of, you know, Jesus. So I, I see a lot. I see a lot of people right now, a lot of really brave people who are coming out of the shadows because you just, you just can't bear where you are. And, you know, Douglas was right. I'd rather be hated for who I am than love for who I'm not. And so many of them I have great compassion because they're just now, they're, they're just now asking their own questions between 35 and 45 because that process was not allowed them when they were conscripted into ministry mm-hmm. and given an orthodoxy that was supposedly fixed and concretized. It's so unfair. So that's, that's my audience. That's the people I want to spend time with and am spending time with and honored to do it. And I may be just a little while down the road, but that's been my journey. I just turned 50 and this journey began in earnest for me. Gosh, 20 years ago mm-hmm. and, um, it's tough, but and it's where good. would someone, how would someone connect with you? Um, they can connect with me through the church that I serve that I founded called Grace Point. Go to Grace Point's website. My email's there, Mitchell at gracepoint.net. They can find me on Facebook. On Facebook. Grace Point with an E. Grace Point with an E. We tried to make it as hard for people as we possibly could. We thought about putting like two Swedish dots above the I and E just to really get fancy. But uh, they can find me at Grace Point. I'm also working. Uh, I took a year contract to work with some friends of mine up at East Lake Community Church in mm-hmm. Seattle. I'm just a teaching pastor there. Um, so they can find me at East Lake, Grace Point, Facebook, Stan Mitchell. That's where I do all the LGBTQ pastoring and advocacy work mostly. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Well, everyone join me in thanking Stan and welcoming Dr. Robin. So um, if you're a regular homebrewed Christianity listener, then, then you know last year one of my podcast resolutions was to talk to Dr. Robin at least every other month. And then um, once we got theologically entangled, we keep coming up with reasons to do stuff together. So, and we're grateful to Catherine Keller for the entanglement. I know. Uh, and my thing is uh, anyone that Catherine Keller entangles you with, then you have to just let that concress all over the place. You have to let it become. Yeah. And that's a philosophy joke for people with PhDs. There's a certain group giggling about concressive comments, and the rest are like, what's that? Right. But Other I dare people just someone, don't care. Yeah, I dare someone to, to ask, like, can you explain what right. Whitehead means by concrescence in the Q&A part? Right. Uh, that occasionally happens at live events. We're not going to do see. that tonight. No, no. I mean, unless I mean, you're going to do that. No, no, I don't want to. I've never found it to be a positive experience right. for 98% of the people right. in the room. But I do support Alfred North Whitehead. Um, I'm the most important philosopher in my life. Uh, and anyway, so uh, first question. Uh, and and I've, I was thinking about this. I was so glad we had the record set up. Now, you remember what the second – so you have Paul record the whole, like, first and second naivete thing. And and that was his response to Boltmann's demythologizing. Right. Where you demythologize the text, and then a lot of people are like, yeah, you just ripped a bunch of stuff off of the tradition and found Heidegger. Um, but what what do we do? Then he said the next move, you don't just have to demythologize. You have to de-ideologize the text. Mm-hmm. That in the same way that there's mythology there that you have to learn to treat as mythology to get to the goodness, there's also ideology at work in the text, that the power structures in which they were formed, written, edited, and compiled – Exist, and you also have to learn to recognize the ideology to see the acidic nature of the gospel that pushes through those and contemporary ideologies. So, think thinking of that way, that like second move of Paul Ricoeur, um, we're at dinner, and Andy's like, "So, would you go by Christian?" And I was like, oh, "This would be fun." Uh, and and your answer is really like. Well, if you're asking me about, like, Jesus, the prophetic tradition, like, yeah, but if you're asking me about American Christianity, I don't know, I don't know. What I actually said was that today Christianity equals white supremacy. That's what I said. Well, I, I was trying to summarize a long conversation. Yes, but I think that's particular, right? There's yeah, yeah. a specificity to my response when people ask me if I'm a Christian. So I'm trained as a theologian and ethicist. I, all of my work is public theology, mm-hmm. and I spend most of my time in progressive religious contexts. Um, and 
and when people pe- people are so tied up with, do you believe in this thing called Christianity? And what I say to people is, I don't care about what you believe. I care about your politics. In what ways are you living that live out the tradition in meaningful ways? And for an academic, politics is bigger than like who you voted for. Right. I'm not talking about conservative. Well, I know, but Democrat. a lot of people don't know when you say, I care about your politics. They're like, yeah, but I mean, I guess one sucks less than the other, but that's not that big a deal. But you mean politics in the robust sense. What I mean when I say politics is I mean the ways in which you are living your life, your social practices, the everydayness. Mm-hmm. And why that's important is because it shows up with where you vote or who, for whom you vote, right? And so when people – people are so wrapped up in the, um, the labels, which I think is part of the ways in which we create ideology – Ideology is about belief and is about a spectrum, and I could care less what that label is. Um, so am I a Christian? I've been deeply formed and socialized by this tradition. As I said to Andy, I have three degrees in theology, but I would never come out and say I'm a Christian. But if you read my book, you, you would be confused. You, you would be reading the Christian story. And so what's your question? Well, my, my question was the uh, – it was a setup to say what is the biggest ideology that's unseen and un, uh, uh, you know, like not put on Front Street and white supremacy is where I was going. So anyway, like that – like when we take – so you know, Ricoeur is thinking of uh, one of the main targets in his work because he's a European uh, is the way in which anti-Semitism laid silent – in European Christianity for so long uh, that it it brought demonic forces to the fore that were actualized and empowered by the church. And when we think of American Christianity, um, because we decide to start to tell our story as a nation in one place and forget the first two chapters, um, we tell a glory story when w- one of the... A, an essential part to tell our story honestly is how many crosses we managed to use this new world to build, right? And it includes maybe not crosses, but lynching memorials, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I meant metaphorical yeah. crosses. Yeah. So, like, one of the challenges for for me, in the same way that you hear, like when when Stan's talking about growing up in one place, not having certain things on the agenda, having it there, and then trying to help bring people out of it. To me, one of the things that has made our friendship and um, sharing and stuff em- empowering and challenging to me is getting to a place to realize that you and I as Baptist children of the South mm-hmm. saying the same – Or the northern occupied territory of Texas. Or the, I, I mean the northern occupied territory Texas. of Mexico, which is the Republic of Texas. Yeah. I mean I just want to be you know careful and because – Texas is not the South. I I, I agree. <laughs> I, I think that's the one thing Southerners and Texans can agree on. We don't want you, and you don't want us. Um, but I do live here in Nashville, and so I think I can say I'm in the South and mm-hmm. from the South and of the South. So the uh, you, you know how like in life, occasionally things like line up, and then all of a sudden there's like a breakthrough, and then you have that oh shit moment. So you called me the day after I had one, where I like hardly slept. And po- made poor life decision to decide to reread James Cone at three in the morning when you're already feeling overwhelmed. And so I'm sitting there and I'm like, God, I don't even know what to do with this. I, I was contracted to write a book on sin. Cause I was like, I have a lot of thoughts on that, namely inheriting a relational theology and the sciences and social sciences, thinking about the way you inherit sin, biology, culture, and right. all that. And then, uh, it was like a nerdy come to Jesus moment where God's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. but if you're going to write a doctrine of sin in America, slaveholding Christianity should be your primary yeah. reference point. And orthodoxy in ortho, the Orthodox church in America is the one that's been resisting it the whole time. So then you don't know this part of the story. So then the next day you and I are talking for something we're doing on the internet. And I said to you offhand, Um, I was just thinking about something because you had shared a story about growing up Baptist. 
Have you ever thought about the fact that we grew up singing all the same hymns slaveholders sing in churches with their slaves? And you said that it was kind of cute and or convicting. You said, oh, honey, good job. And and that was it. And then I got done. I don't even remember what happened the rest of the call till I edited it. And I was like, I'm glad I didn't fail. And I got done. And it was like Jesus was like, that's right, mother. You're going to have to dwell on this. Um, and so, so when you think of that, uh, when you call not like that question around white supremacy, the question around race, how do you set that in a context of faith and and not just partisan politics? And what is it like to have that question uh, press its weight uh, in, in a way that's calling us to shape our souls and our relationships and not just our uh, um, you know, the things we like on Facebook and retweet on t- and that kind of thing? Well, I mean, I think the first first thing I have to be honest about is that I was born uh, to a Mexican woman out of this country, and um, immigration has been a lifetime story for me. Mm-hmm. And when you think about the struggle to live um, growing up with deep poverty, um, and a and a woman of color telling you that. Education is your way out. Um, you learn how to invest in strategies for liberation. And when you begin to orient your, um, yourself in that way, I think it shapes and shifts what we begin to think about, um, reality mm-hmm. or existential moments or um or the thing that animates our being right mm-hmm. and so when i when i'm honest about that in my best moments i i can say that and in and in my less best moments um i am hell bent on burning the thing down. Mm-hmm. Right. And so it's finding a balance between being a revolutionary and a charlatan. And it's about embodying the spirit of abolu- uh, abolition while also remembering that, um, that Jesus was a revolutionary. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and that he's, he stood for anti empire strategies in ways that, caused his death and so you know like i i i've been very open about i don't believe that either the republicans or democrats have an answer and that we need to revolutionize the ways in which we think about um electoral politics Mm -hmm. in this country in the same way religion needs to as well that we have gotten into a um we've gotten into sort of um strategy and an orientation of well let's just um change a few things here and there let's take out male language and the hymns um you know the episcopals just voted on to remove male language from their book of common prayer, prayer. And let's change these little things, but, you know, changing the little things is like getting tied up in partisan politics. And so are those strategies, will those strategies point toward collective liberation? And so, um, I mean, I, I don't think they do. And the, the work I think of today's church and today's faith communities is the work of dismantling hegemonies that get us in a spot that make us choose like Republican and Democrat. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's, and it's figuring out what are the strategies to flourishing, right? This is why I think all theology is ethics. Um, what are the strategies to flourishing? What are the ways that we can live so that we are not reifying hegemonies? Um, for me, that has been 
about looking at activism as a form of theology Mm -hmm. and looking at the ways in which protest actually gives us a liturgy or a ritual for the ways in which we can be in this world. Um, so those are some of the things that, yeah. that I, that I think about. So, uh, what did you learn in Charlottesville? Not just on the ground, but in that after and reflecting and thinking about it. Mm. I mean, you might I, want to tell the story in case people, obviously everyone here didn't listen to the previous episode. <laughs> um, but like, uh, yeah, so you can set it up narrative wise, but yeah, in retrospect, I mean, what so, are the learnings? So August, August 12th, 2017, the, the alt right had a convening in Charlottesville, um, because this, to protect the Robert E. Lee statue, the, the, there was a move to take down the statue as there was all across the South. And I was part of a, of a cohort of national faith leaders um to come into Charlottesville to be in solidarity with the folks who are on the ground and so I did that and there are lots of things that happened uh, you may have seen some of that on on the news um one of the things that happened was during our service um on Friday night we were surrounded by tiki torches and neo nazis and um unable to leave and you know it was a moment where i had to get real clear on like what my work is and that i'm a public figure that i travel and oh shit now neo nazis are circling this church and what am i going to do right um and so you know we were there for several hours um it, it was a mess in lots of ways in lots of in lots of ways that were harm was harmful and so much of my work is about harm reduction that um to be in that place that was packed i mean gosh that that episcopal church could probably hold a thousand people and there were probably 12 or 1300 people there i mean it was just packed and by the time we were all able to leave, we went. I didn't get any sleep that night, and I just didn't feel good about what was going to happen the next day. And one of the things, so I'm a five on the Enneagram, which means I'm in the head triad, and I'm not su- – I have to work really hard to get into my body. I'm also an academic, which means I, I'm always thinking, right? And so my inability to sleep was – I think a ways, a way in which my body was trying to say to me, like, look, you, this is not a safe place to be. And I didn't get any sleep that night. I was very, very, um, very, very concerned about what could happen. And I decided to hold, um, public witness at the corner of second and water. And during that time, um, I was there with a, a few other people and my security detail at the time, um, um, was very gracious with me and we were standing there near the, where all the news cameras were because Tracy Blackman was giving um, an interview and you can see all this on television. Um, but neo-Nazis lunged in our direction, um, and believing that violence was intended for us. My security detail picks me up and the security detail for Tracy picks her up and, we are whisked away and placed into um a sort of a gated lot that was full of um Virginia state police so not exactly the safest place to be right during that time um the, um cans filled with concrete began to be lodged in um our direction and the state police did nothing and this is my first experience with state police. And, and I thought this, this is crazy, right? And my security detail said, let's go and get you something to eat. You, you're, not, this is not a safe place to be. I'm a trans person. I'm a queer person, right? Like it's not safe. And I was in, you know, my clergy attire with, with a stove that said Black Lives Matter and a resistance fist on it. And, and so we left and, and Clinton brought me, got me something to eat and then took me to the hotel during which time my hotel was compromised. Someone tried to get into my room and I was whisked away to a safe house. 
all that to say, um, my lesson there is we should not be tra- chasing white supremacists around trying to disrupt whatever they're doing. That is some people's job. And also we need to like do work from the ground with our people in our communities, in our churches, in our restaurants, in our bars. We, we need to be talking to people. And one of the things that I think Tripp and I share is a real desire to try to have honest conversations about how to dismantle the hegemonies that keep us all victim of the bullshit that keeps a boot on our neck. And so the main, I mean, the main lesson is, um, neo-Nazis are scary and I don't ever want to be around that. But also the other lesson is like white supremacy is real and there's so much hatred in this world and we are failing to be human with one another. And I don't care what you believe, but I do care about how you live your life. And if you're living your life in such a way that erects systems of power and domination that puts my people at risk and other people of color at risk, then that's a bad way to live. Mm -hmm. That was my lesson of Charlottesville. Thank you. Um, One of the things in your forthcoming book, um, Activist Theology, that I'm super excited about getting this help people to get is uh, a book that started as super nerd theory turned into theological autobiography. Um, and one of the things you wrestle with is uh, your own inheritance of being from multiple cultures, multiple groups and, and how, like what are the, what is, like, what have you gained in that process of exploring your own biography and story again with the lens and wisdom you gained um, you know, as an academic? Mm. And and what do you bring that? Because one of the challenges, this is the way I would put it out, you don't use it exactly this way, that uh, in many ways the cycles of violence and oppression exist until victim and violators both find something else to do because we – tend to do unto others as has been done to us. Right. And one of the things I loved about some of the narratives in your book is you use them and explore both sides of it Mm -hmm. and what you're inheriting and how do you deal with both sides. Yeah. And so thinking of a church in America that doesn't just want to recognize issues, but what is it like to set victims and violators on a different relationship and to kind of process that uh, the, the multiple streams that come into our identities? Well, I mean, I mean, a few things come to my mind, and one is we don't know our own stories. So many of us, so many of us are disconnected from our own stories, and the work of rehumaning one another and restoring ourselves is to tell our stories. And we begin to tell the stories of pain, and we begin to tell the stories of joy, and when we begin to tell the stories of, ouch, that hurts, um, we begin to be able to come a little bit closer to the contours that shape our lives. And when we're able to do that, it, it impacts the ways in which we live, right? And so part of, part of my book is telling, a, telling both and, right? Telling about, the deafening silence of my father who employed undocumented workers and also talking about how I was developing a moral compass during that time. And, and I think we have to be able to hold the complexity of the both and it's not either or it is always both and, and how do we repair the things that are broken? It's holding the complexities of our own stories and the stories of other others and building bridges with lines of radical difference. And when when we do that work, when we build the bridges, you know, bridges are threshold spaces. Mm-hmm. Bridges are not a point for a point A to point B. Bridges are liminal spaces. It's an opportunity for us to lean in to a new imagination. Um 
I think that's the work that we need to be about. And that's so much of the story of Jesus. Yeah. But we, but we have been so wrapped up in the ways in which the stories of Jesus has, has been institutionalized into a creed, which that's a different conversation. We could talk about creeds and the power of creeds, but we get so wrapped up in belief statements that we don't actually lean into the real stories that animate our lives. And there's power in that. There's power in the ways in which we live our stories or the ways that we don't. Um, my story is a story of being born to a Mexican woman, not of this country. There was lots of abuse in my life and I moved to live with my white father I assimilated into whiteness. I learned how to code switch and I learned to hold the complexity of the human experience in those moments. And the church became my salvation. Mm -hmm. And then I like became this trans queer person who like loved ideas and believed that ideas can change the world. But I can't forget my roots, which is part of the reason why I moved back to the South after the 2016 election, I left my faculty post in lovely Berkeley, California. You know, I hope Jesus told you to do that because that's queer utopia, y'all. Berkeley, California, the <laughs> Bay Area. <laughs> I left them queers for the South. All right. So last question is uh, you love exploring the metaphor of the front porch. One I of do. the things I consistently get asked it, are people looking like, where do you begin to start to build front porch space? So thinking of uh, one of the lines, I don't know if you said this, it was just told back to me in the email, was that you and Dr. Robin are talking and y'all discussed uh, taking the revolution to the table or like the spaces where you sit with the people. Yeah. You're around your love that you bring together. Yeah. What's that look like? And how do you how do you begin to think about uh, the time and spaces together when you share meals, which is one of preparing meals is one of your spiritual gifts. It is. Uh, it's my part of my vocation as theologian. Yeah. So what, what, what's it look like to, to start to seize those opportunities as space to make difference? Well, I, I mean, I think I can point to dinner this evening with Andy, you and Rachel mm -hmm. and myself. Um, and I can point to, I mean, I, I knew you, but, Rachel and Andy were new to the table and how do we create um, hospitable space for people to become right. And what are the great moments of dinner with Andy was him asking me, are you a Christian? Mm -hmm. You know, and like, I don't know this guy. I know that he runs this like studio company and he probably works with real famous people, different kind of famous than you and I are. Yeah. Not nerd famous. Right. Like, not nerd. Normal famous. Yeah. Normal people. Yeah. To. Yeah. And, and I, and it was like a moment for me to say, okay, like, am I going to step into this moment and seize it for its possibility? Or am I just going to give a canned answer of like, well, you know, I'm a theologian and, you know, da, 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 da. But I decided to seize the moment of like, this is a comrades of trips and trip had already said, Andy's a cool guy. So like, I'm going to trust trip, right? I'm going to trust the table mate. Mm -hmm. And, and lean into this moment. And there over burgers and beer and cheese fries, which Praise were not as good as the ones that we had at Denver. No, those were, those were, those were really good. Those were top notch yeah. cheese fries. If we ever have a side podcast together, it should just be called cheese fries. We where, have so many side podcasts, yeah, but a cheese fry podcast. I really feel like the best cheese fries in the country should have us come and assess it. But we would only be in Denver. That, those were so good. <laughs> anyway, sorry. So, so I, you know, one of the things that I love to do is have meals with people. And here was this moment that I was having a meal with a stranger who I'm reading as a straight white cis guy. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to like lean into it and see what happens. And, you know, when I do that with folks and when I sort of let the hackles go down, and relax, I find these moments of truth, beauty, and goodness, right? And so the question of where do we find the front porch, which look for the documentary next year on the front porch. Um, but I, we have to start having meals together. 
Like we have to start eating with one another. It, it's part of the work of becoming human with one another again, which is something we do really, really poorly. We spend our time isolated and alone, which is, which is a outcome of neoliberal capitalism. We don't know how to build community. We don't know how to listen to one another's stories. We don't even know how to listen. Um, and in that moment of sharing a meal with one another, it's really hard to hate people when you're eating with them mm-hmm. is what I found. And so one of the, my favorite things to do is like sit and talk with conservative evangelicals over a meal. They most often are not drinking, but I am, <laughs> which is totally fine. You're like, I can hang out with you longer if I'm drinking, all <laughs> right? Right, right. right. But but I, I think we have to figure out um, – I mean I think table space can can be lots of different things. Um, I think we have to be able to lean into our imagination. Mm-hmm. And I think it's one of the things that we are failing right now. We are failing – it's like a failure to launch. We are failing to have an imagination. Yeah. Right? We – let me say this one last thing because I know that we want to like do the whole – y'all, they ask questions to us. Um we – all of us want the 2020 election to come, all of us, no matter what side you're on. And if you're always living in a future moment and not realizing the present now, we are failing to imagine. And my hope around this setting the table and creating table space and building a front porch – is building a present now. And it's about leaning into imagination because it's when imagine, it's with imagination that there are conditions for change. And those are the moments that are ripe for social change. Mm-hmm. And if we don't, if we don't harness that moment and if we don't harness our imagination, then we once again are failing to be human with one another. Yeah. Preach. Um, so go over that microphone. Uh, the, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of a first century Jew who made, uh, a code table habitation, uh, one of the edgy elements of his ministry. Yeah. You want to talk about the Eucharist? I could talk all night about the Eucharist. Hold on. Pause. All right. There we go. What? Tell us your name first. Um, Lydia. Lydia. Is this for all of us? Sure. Yeah. Oh, so best food for a meal, a productive conversation. You well, go. I mean, I grew up on Texas barbecue, so I'm a big fan of barbecue. Um, but you know, you don't want to you don't want to get people so satiated that they can't think and talk. So if you give them too 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 many, um, too much like barbecue, pork, and whatnot, macaroni and cheese. Oh, then they then they might not I might, might not be able to talk but I'm a big <laughs> believer I'm a big believer in um in that and like do like I I do a lot of um, Mexican cooking and so I will cook carnitas and so I'll roast I pork just got all- hungry. <laughs> I I will roast pork all day and then make the carnitas in the evening before people come over and then people will eat tacos and um, that tends to – I mean, A, they love it, and people – you know, it's finger food, so people get talking. But I always have enough wine and beer on hand because pe- people always people always love to drink um, when they're eating tacos. Yeah. What, what's, what's like the, the meal if they're at your house and you're wanting to – Really get campy and, and everybody be comfortable? That's yeah, yeah. Meat and three. Of course, where I grew up, our vegetables had more fat grams than the fried chicken. <laughs> so, yeah, keep it campy. Down home, cornbread, black-eyed peas, collard green, mm, chicken fried steak, fried chicken. Mm. But if you're lucky, I'll roast a chicken, and I'll make collard greens and homemade cornbread. That's if you're lucky. Like if we were if we were having a real conversation, like if we were having to talk about real shit, I'm gonna roast a chicken or a duck. So I've actually thought about this because I'm a, a very big extrovert. My wife is a hardcore introvert. We're both ordained ministers, so um, 
I cycle through my friends until she finds one she wants to come back. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And um, sometimes it's an individual, sometimes it's a couple, sometimes it's a, a herd. But when they pass, like, and her, her smell test is so much better than mine. Like, I've like liked people. She's like, I wouldn't trust them. Then, like, two years later, I'm like, you're right. Um, but like the the Alicia says, I want them to come over. I think we should keep them. Meaning, like, I want to bring them in the inner circle. And once you get in, these individuals will come to you. You get told like, if it's your birthday and you want us to throw you the party, you tell us, and you can come to any of the big holidays and stuff. Now we're in North Carolina. We don't have. We just moved uh, to North Carolina a little bit ago. But in California, we, you know, Christmas there'd be five or six extra people. Thanksgiving that, and it's. Build your own pizza night. We have like the big, you know, uh, stove and I make the dough the night before. So it stretches out then New York style side. And here's the trick for that. You let them know, like you say, you can bring the third bottle of wine because the first two are so good. Right. And they know it's so good. So they can't drink it fast because that's the key. Like you want them to be savoring the wine because once right. you decide, you're picking your items, and everyone's pizzas are coming out differently. So you're not like setting down for that awkward thing, where it's like, "All right, are we going to pray or not?" And I, I say I could in California because all of my kids, if you don't pray, will make you feel awkward and be like, "We haven't said thank you." And I'm like, I have like the they're very Christian or they're not at all prayer, and I'm like. Universe that gives us all good gifts all the way to sweet baby Jesus that invented pizza. Like, you know, there's a different version for whoever's coming. But you, you like, you make your own pizza, which lets them, you learn something about based on pizza toppings. I have a small typology based on pizza toppings. Um, do, when I pull out the four different types of topping cheese, do you go all junk? And if you're that person, you and I are going to be friends. Like when you are like, so it's not just mozzarella. You're like, actually, no, there's regular mozzarella, goat mozzarella, and it ain't no part skim milk junk. And then you're like, yeah, but you also have hard Italian cheeses. Sweet Jesus. I want it thin with lots of cheese. No other things. Then if you're like, you have all the fresh vegetables as options. Awesome. And I'm like, that's good. If you put sausage on it, but. The, so like I have, I start to assess based on that. Then you get in a conversation, like what kind of pizza do you have? You all make your own pizza. But then you have like the two nice bottles of wine, which lead to us telling stories about the people at the winery, right? That, cause they were, this is California. So like we were members at the winery cause someone at our church probably owned part of it. That's how they let us become members. We didn't tell them that part. But, uh, and then you like you're savoring the wine. If you're savoring wine, you're waiting on each individual pizza. By the time you are all sitting down, there's no awkward conversation because you've all got to know each other enough. And uh, and it's not until everyone sits down, Alicia lets me ask everyone a question because I will naturally like if this podcast was technically done, I'd be like, hey, hey, before you leave, I just had this idea. Like, what is your favorite comic book? And half of you are like, I don't read fucking comic books. But I'm, but the ones that do, I'm like, that's awesome. Let's get – anyway. So I, the, the pizza and the nice wine has been the way my hyper-extrovert and super-introvert family brings people in. And uh, it's led to lots of aunts and uncles that are in our family pictures and stuff who are the – you know, don't have their family in L.A. that end up joining our family. And we have family pictures where – you you know, there's like three members of our family picture at Easter every year that are they're not different. related to us. Yeah, and they're different every year. They're like, well, who's that? So, and and I do think that's uh, that's really important. Um, yeah. So, I get my pizza is probably better than his because I make a cast iron skillet pizza. Oh well. How thick is the crust though? It's real thick. Yeah. See, because when you do individual ones, you have to have thin so you can like do it where everyone makes their own. And that's when they have to come into the extrovert zone because I get attached to it. So every person that cycles through while you're putting your toppings right. on, I'm like, Robin. Right. So we got these two different bottles of wine. Do you like like an Italian blend or do you want like the big stain your teeth cap? Blah, 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 blah. Right. And then I'm like, you know I have a beer fridge out back, right? I brew my own <laughs> beer. Do you have a favorite beer style? I, I've meddled multiple times. Do you like beer? Because I could teach you how to brew it. And if you told me, you have fruit in your yard, we'll make a beer with the fruit in your yard in it. And because in my head, I'm like, my introvert wife has said we can keep this one. And so. My pizza is still better. I just want to make I, that official. You, you want to know? I, I am, I'm open and affirming to all types of pizza. Like, I don't even know if I've had a bad pizza. 
No, I have. But we don't have to go there. <laughs> Does that answer your food substitu- question? I- okay. All right, I'm ready. <laughs> I can I can seat six. Olive oil is not a substitute for tomato sauce, unless you're allergic to tomatoes. Let the people ask. I know. I, I'm, I was vamping until I saw someone. The spirit's going to move on someone. I see nods. I see smiles. I see anticipation. The moment I pause, they're like, Tiffany. Yeah. Uh, I'm from Nashville. Um, and I grew up in the Southern Baptist home as well. Um, my husband, Russ, and I have three boys. Um, and I'm just wondering if there's any Christians, but we both grew up in very conservative Christian homes, and I personally, I can't speak for Russ, but have struggled the last couple of years on how to communicate with my family in this era that we live in now, mm-hmm. and how divided the country is, and how divided my own family is, and yeah. how do I live my life like, like you were saying, Robin, where it's, um, it's not, it's your politics. Meaning how you live your life, yeah. just how you voted. How did you do that respectfully with your family without compromising your beliefs and what you know to be true with the people you love who raised you and formed you and, like you said, Stan, that you you don't want to throw out the, what you, how you were brought up and what you're talking in the water, even if it was contaminated. But it's really hard to know how do you have those honest conversations. Because they're harder to have with people that you love and their family than they are with a stranger off the street because there's so much history and there's so much respect for them because of their position in your family, but mm. there's so many differences. Thank you, so Tiffany. Any Let's, advice? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think we probably, there are three of us here, and we probably have mm. 17 different answers, Yeah. right? Um, and I don't want to go first because I just spent a whole long time talking. So well, somebody else go. I just spent seven days with my mom and dad um, at Christmas. Nina and I were there. I, I I don't talk to my mom and dad about this. They know where I am. We've had these conversations, not ad infinitum, but ad nauseum. And, you know, I, I'm a 12-stepper. I do believe that we can change everything in this world except three things, people, places, and things. And that pretty much keeps me in my hula hoop. I do believe um, in activism and advocacy. But in terms of my family, you know, any time that my dad and I would engage in the in these conversations, which I will just say, my faith to my parents – uh, and my parents are wonderful people. My faith is devastating to them. They're devastated by this. Uh, they grieve themselves silly. They believe their lives have been shortened by the grief. And that may be histrionic, but I, and I will say this about my mom and dad. I, I don't, uh, you know, the, the caricature of these mean spirited fundamentalists is, is not true of all of these people. My mom and dad are so much better than their theology. Uh, periodically when pressed, I will tell my dad, if if God turns out to be half the person that you are, we're all in good shape. It's just, uh, what was it you said yesterday? Uh, the, the- uh, yeah, my, if uh, my family like that, I'm always like, it's really depressing when your God's only half as nice as you are. Like, uh, it, it, you're like, oh, the infinite God of love. Yeah, and, and obviously it's a he it is about half as nice as me on a day where I don't have enough sugar. And it it really is a predicament that, you know. Well, when I'm in a conversation with, if I do engage with with family or close people that are in completely different philosophical headspaces than I'm in on these things, I think to myself in that moment, what possible chance do they have of changing my mind? It's generally between zero and minus 10%. Why would I think it's different for them? You know, I'm I'm not coming to that space with any sense that they're going to change my mind. I don't have any sense that I'm going to change theirs. I do know through pastoral work um, that people do change. I've changed. But when I look back at the change, I do think the conversations mattered. I do think they accumulated. Um, I think it's a it's a real egregious mistake 
to be in a conversation and someone change at that moment and think that conversation changed them. You may be there for the straw moment, but it took a lot of those moments for me. I do believe, though, that, you know, Parker Palmer says it's amazing that a religion so vested in the idea of incarnation so often gets lost in disembodied concepts. And we are an incarnational people, and, you know, to everything that Robin does and, you know, activist theology, Jesus is not going to say well-believed. He's going to say well-done. And I, I do believe ultimately the thing that has continued to shift, not just the macro church, but the micro individuals within that church, we are an incarnational people, and eventually anecdotal, experiential, lived-out flesh experiences accumulate in people's lives. They did mine. They accumulate, and they become almost a memorial that's so dissonant with the received dogma that there's this tension, and you either jettison the text or you jettison your experience. You know, I'm, I'm, I just don't do a lot of parsing of the text or arguing of, you know, theory anymore. I just try to live my life in such a way that maybe my life will be a bit more of the incarnational accumulation that will drive them back to the text because we have a long history of being driven by experience back to the text saying, my God, did we read this right? From the fundamentalist Pentecostal preacher that I was, it was not, it was not wrestling through the four sides of Romans 127. I pastored gay people and they were beautiful people and they were in no way akin to theoretically what we said they were. And it was just, there are these Acts 11 moments where the elders in Jerusalem look and say, you shouldn't even have eaten with those people. And Peter doesn't say, well, let's look at that text again. Peter says, I I know, I said the same thing. But I saw the Holy Spirit fall on them as it did on us in the beginning. And I don't know what to do with that. And the question posed back to him was, how do we argue this? And I just, I, I think, I stay out of the arguments anymore. I just, it's just not where it is for me. I just live, live my life. And maybe sometime living your life is just lovingly watching a, you know, a movie every night. I spent six nights and every night I put Nina to bed and I would call Justin. I said, I'm sitting here watching a movie with my dad. It's the best I can do. You know, I'm a trans queer Latinx who had to leave my family because of all of their beliefs and ideologies around who I was, um, who they understood themselves to be. Um, that's on one side. And on the Mexican side of my family, they all voted for Trump except my mother. And there is abuse and dysfunction, and I just had to leave it all. And, and I talked to my mother every day. Part of my orientation in life is harm reduction. What type of relationship can I have with people that reduces harm? Mm-hmm. I believe love is revolutionary, and I believe that not all people love in revolutionary ways. I also believe people are selfish and narcissistic and manipulative, and people will do whatever they can to make themselves feel better. And making family sometimes means that you make family with folks with whom you don't share blood. And, and, and I talk to my mother every day, right? Now we, we mostly talk about the weather or like, what am I having for breakfast? So like the substance of the conversation, right? Like in what way can I have a relationship with this woman that reduces harm? And in what way can I share a relationship with Tripp and his family that actually encourages my deepest, most radical flourishing? In many ways, Tripp and I are closer than my mother and I. And I talk to my mother every day. Right? I mean, relationships are so complicated, especially, especially when we believe certain things. For example, you sort of led with, I think I would call myself a progressive Christian. I mean, there are certain, there are certain beliefs that go with that or certain politics that go with that. Right. 
you probably believe that like the poor should not be poor, but like how do we dismantle the system that creates poverty, right? That you hold these values and creating relationships with people who might say something like, well, they did that to themselves. Bridging that, like, right? Like you're not going to bridge that. But what you, but, but what you can do is love in a way that draws a boundary and that models to them what you understand to be progressive Christianity. And I think it goes back to what I said earlier is like, do you want to be a revolutionary or a charlatan? Mm-hmm. And kindness. Kindness goes a long way. If, it, you know, I can be an ass to a lot of people, but I think the one thing that I really pride myself on is like, I, I will be overly kind. But like, if you're going to talk about, um, racism in a way that like doesn't really exist and we're in a pro- post racial world, I'm probably going to be an ass to you because that shit is like, is killing people. But if you're really leaning in to this possibility of be, being human with one another, your experience of me will be like, I'm kind, right? And I think that's one thing that we have to figure out with our families who maybe vote differently or live differently or like maybe give to focus on the family who are like trying to kill people like me, right? I mean, it's very complicated. Do we choose kindness? Are we able to draw boundaries? And who's our family? It may not be the people with whom we share blood, right? I don't know if that's helpful. Good. All right. Let's do one more question and then we can hang out because those are long-winded answers. Yes. Do you have a favorite misinterpreted text? Oh, that's a fun question. Oh, yeah. Oh, Sodom and Gomorrah is probably my favorite one. Well, you have to say something about it. like you. Oh, you know, everyone believes that Sodom and Gomorrah is about homosexuality, but it's not. And homosexuality is like uh, an invention. It's you know, it's not. It's a social construction. But Sodom and Gomorrah is about inhospitality. Well, inhospitality it turns into gang rape. Uh, surprisingly, everyone's against it. <laughs> right. It's one of those, and, and Ezekiel has the line about it being about inhospitality. Yep. Or the Romans one passage, um, that's really about Roman games. It's not about homosexuality, right? That God gave them over to the lust, to the desires of their, what is it, Stan? Desires of their lust to. The um, desires of their heart? Yeah. Desires of their heart to do those things that are unseemly, King James Version. Yeah. Sometimes unseemly things, though, are cool. But you know how I was taught. I, you know, I was I went to three religiously affiliated schools, and in my in an undergraduate degree, I my degree was in theology, and my New Testament professor said to me that the Romans one passage was about Roman games, not about homosexuality. And I was like, well, okay, Don Williford, mm-hmm. I know you're conservative, but but conservative enough to like actually want to tell you what the Bible is really right. talking about. Not like conservative enough where you find random Bible passages to justify all sorts of things. Yeah, favorite uh, misinterpreted passages are primal text, Genesis 1 through 3. I, I, I don't think it teaches a narrative of sin, separation, sacrifice, salvation. I, I, I think that model is erroneous. I think it teaches a message of shame, estrangement vulnerability and healing. Um, they sinned, God still came. The idea that the definition of God's holiness is God's incapacity to be with us and our brokenness or our sin is ridiculous. And to found it on that text, God still came. They were hiding. And animal skins weren't taken to cover their sins so God could be comfortable with them. Animal skins covered their shame so they could be comfortable with God. If we ever... Turn that upside down. The whole th- the trajectory would be so much different with Christianity's message. We don't need to get people saved. We need to help help people realize they've always been safe, and live into that safeness that they were born the beloved of God and 
Sin can't possibly separate them from God. There is no such thing as separation. And apologies to Pascal, there is no God-shaped blank because God never left. So Genesis 1 through 3, primal text. I think we just got to reverse it. And it's reversible if we just read it. But I, I like I just prefer to talk about the Bible than read it. It's much easier that much way. Much easier. That way you can just as the Bible says. No, let me tell you, this one got me reading the I had to read all four damn go- gospels. Uh you know uh, I know, but here's the thing is so I had a number of texts that popped in my head, but it connects to it connects to what you're saying that uh we like to create problems that don't exist and don't get over them is the prodigal son story. Um mm-hmm. I heard that preached in the most horrible way consistently because it sets up for you like obviously repenting and coming home. And the insight about the prodigal son story when you read the whole thing is that the youngest son and the older son, the most true thing about them is who their parents were and they didn't do shit for it. And the problem for both of them is they resist the identity that was given to them and they did nothing for it. That from the day they were conceived, they had certain person as their father and their mother. And that each one of us are made and known and loved completely by God. And then we spend our lives running from that reality. Some of it's ugly and sin and we give a sinner a narrative to come back. But then you have like the older brother who never, ever embraced the banquet that's before him. And then you get him like, well, I'm going to have a party for my older brother. My younger brother comes back. You never give me a chicken to have a party with my son, my friends. Which, honestly, like, if my kids ever, like, you didn't give me a chicken for a party, I'll be like, I'm going to give you a stinking chicken. I'm going to give you two chickens. So shut up. But like, he's sitting there going, and, the, and dad's like, you, you misunderstand. Everything I have has always, always been yours. And I think that part of the problem with Christianity as we experience it today is that we can't tell the good news without convincing someone they're a sinner first. But... In a post-religious world, no one runs around and goes, I woke up this morning worried about eternal conscious torment. And then you're like, well, conveniently, I'll tell you about the prodigal son. (laughs) It's a wonderful analogy to deal with this anxiety you have. Now, if you become a judgmental church person, there's also the older brother. Uh, When the story is you come up with narratives and and then you go and live them out and they're destructive. You may not have left home or you've left home, but in both of those narratives, you live a life that's not as full and complete embracing the love your parents have for you, enabling a life-giving relationship with your friends and peers around you. You don't experience that infinite depth of uh, depth of love and life and blessing because you don't believe the most true thing about you is whose you are, not what you've done, where you've gone, and what you believe. And if we paid attention to that text and then it comes right after the woman looking for the lost coin and the shepherd looking for the lost sheep. And in both of those stories, the found object has no agency, right? Because the shepherd seeks until it's found. The woman searches until it's found. And yes, those are analogies to God being a female with a broom and a shepherd with a little hooky thing. Um, But those are setting up the story so that you realize the point of the story is what's true about you from God's perspective, And we tell stories where we ask for this relationship to die. So some of us leave behind the faith of our, that we're born into for really good reasons, for trauma, for hurt, for pain, for doubt, for questions not allowed to be asked. And we want to know if we can come back. And then when we decide to come back, the only script we know is let me start apologizing. Right? And so the younger son's like, I'll apologize. Maybe I can be a servant. And then the dad's like, shit, I should have had a better children's minister. Why is he trying to do this? And he runs out and gives him a ring and a robe, puts shoes on his feet, and is like, let's party. Why? Because now you might finally believe what's always been true is true about you. And then the son, all the brothers like, my brother's back. I can't believe this. And dad's like, oh, my goodness. You've been here the whole time. Everything I have has always been yours. And you're, and you're wanting to count wrongs. And I'm sitting here trying to throw a party. So when I, when I think of how many times at some crappy youth camp, the prodigal son story was supposed to set up for my over-caffeinated and sugared self, experiencing extreme guilt for that one time I touched myself while I was pooping or kissed too long on a date or watched an R movie when my parents went to sleep. And that was going to set up like me writing it on like a piece of paper and nailing it to a cross to get set on fire. And they're like, but the prodigal son came back. What are you writing on that piece of paper when you approach the throne of your father? Um, 
And I think, what a horrible story. <laughs> like, and Jesus was sitting there literally pissing off religious people by telling them a story where, guess what? Everything God has has already been given to you. And everything you need to matter that much has already been given. And the most true thing about you is you're God's beloved. And if you think something else, it's a lie. And that's not that crazy. It's what Luther thought before he had bowel issues and anti-Semitism came back. <laughs> but you got to give a guy. It was before, you know, x lax and stuff. So um, with that, I feel like that's a really good time to end the podcast. But do remember, the Bible can do horribly ugly things, but it can also remind us of rather revolutionary things. So tomorrow when you wake up and look in the mirror, whatever narrative's going through your head, remember that the most true thing about you, if Jesus is half right, is that you are known completely, loved completely, and you are the beloved of the divine. So thanks for hanging out. Thank you, Stan.